So, so let's get started. Um, so the first thing I wanted to point out was, was this. Um, so that you didn't spend a whole lot of time fussing with graphics coding, um, I provide a little, little lab here, or just some code snippets <coughs> for the first part of today's homework, which is homework 10. It asks you to, to work through the four variable information diagram and draw things. Well, the drawing things is not hard. I mean, it's just drawing ellipses and having them overlap the right way. So what I did is um, I just put some of that code up here for you. <coughs> so you can go grab this little lab. And uh, uh, when you're plotting um, in Sage, we use this Python library mostly. There are a couple alternatives, but use matplotlib. It looks very much like um, MATLAB, or so I'm told. <coughs> anyway, um, for the information diagrams, you have to plot a bunch of ellipses. So here's some code. Actually, what I did, this is I just stole one of the examples from the matplotlib.org site. And there, no surprise, our ellipse function is already built in. <coughs> so most of this exercise is just looking at documentation and fussing around. Unfortunately, I happen to like this kind of fussing too much. So, <coughs> right, so you, you would hunt around on the website and find ellipse. And this is how you set it up. This code is slightly um, augmented from the example, just so it ran more directly and simply here. But then, uh, seeing how I like to fuss, I modified that. This just throws up some several hundred ellipses. I modified it so that there are just four ellipses so that you have the, at least the, the background diagram. So th this is essentially the four variable diagram I showed in the lecture notes. Right, four variables. There are two to the four minus one atoms, the way we do this. So I mean, you have to check these things. I mean, just putting up four ellipses and making them overlap somehow is not right. There's a particular way they have to do that. So I, so I, I built that in here, <coughs> including some code that lets you label the different atoms. That's part of the exercise. Um, and so, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Two to the four minus one atoms. So each one of those is a particular information measure. Some sort of joint conditional mutual information. Right, so if, if this is H of Y here, this is H of X. H of Z and H of W, <coughs> um, where they all overlap, this is the four-way mutual information, right? I of X semicolon, Y semicolon, Z semicolon, W, okay? Um, this is the variable Y, where I've hacked out everything. So this is H of Y, uncertainty Y, given, I use an exclamation point because my font rendering here gives me a dash. Anyway, exclamation, meaning bar, <coughs> conditioned on, X, Z, and W, which means I take out those pieces. From, there's Y, and I take out everything from the other variables. So this piece right up here is H of Y given X, Z, and W, and so on, right? I mean, the whole point of this is <coughs> that these different information measures, when we first started talking about information theory last quarter, we noticed this sort of parallel between set theory, how different subsets of events related to each other, and these measures. Of course, the measures are nice because they're scalars. We don't have to carry on probability distribution. They're single numbers. So, so this describes the set theoretic structure over four different random variables, their event structure, and also the measures on top of it. So that's the Shannon information measure. Um, and then the second part of, of the homework 10 problem one, second or like D or something like that, is to show which of these atoms are zero because X, Y, Z, and W are a Markov chain, right? In a Markov chain, the intervening variable shield, which means that the various mutual informations are zero. The correlation is broken by the shielding. And that means that these various atoms go to zero in the lecture notes, I talked about how that works for a three-variable Markov chain. I put this down and then showed which atoms are zero. <coughs> and uh, uh, then, then the graphical trick here is basically <laughs> you just take these ellipses. You figure out, you have to do by hand which of these are zero. But there's this graphical diagram, uh, information diagram for Markov chains in the lecture notes are three variables, but basically what you do graphically is you take these ellipses, turn them all vertical and set them down here, and then clip them 
to the, uh, the plotting frame. In fact, maybe I should just show it to you. There. So what I showed you in the lecture notes was a three variable x, y, z version of this. You just add on this. But all I did graphically, the graphical programming is actually you modify in the full four variable graphic basically five lines. So it's not hard. And you just orient these things down. I shift them down and, I, and then the, the plotting package clips it to here. So I kind of get rid of all the intersections down here and then, then you can go through and label these different things. <coughs> with the atoms that are still positive after you've assumed there's this shielding property in the, in the four variable Markov chain. Okay, so just a little bit of helper code there. Not too complicated, I just didn't want you to spend a whole bunch of time figuring out, getting lost in the documentation pages and doing graphics programming rather than thinking about the information theory. So, so there you go. Okay, so today um, I want to bracket the Thursday lecture. The Thursday lecture was maybe philosophy heavy and definition heavy. Like I said, it was the most important thing, but the importance really remains to be um, demonstrated. But take my word for it, that was the biggest lecture. Um, but what I want to do is um, first review where we got, and then we're going to go through a bunch of examples. So what I call epsilon machine reconstruction. How do you go from the specification of a process, specification of the word distribution, to discovering what the hidden states and transition structure is? Right? That's what we did with the prediction game. Right? But we all did it intuitively. Today I want to show you there's nothing intuitive about it. It's completely mechanistic. There's a way of going from the process specification, the word distribution, to finding the hidden states in some sense, finding the intrinsic representation. So, so that's today, might even be kind of a short lecture, depends on how straightforward the examples are that I present. So, so by way of review, <coughs> right, so the end point was this thing I call the epsilon machine. So for historical purposes, they're called epsilon machines. It's a particular kind of hidden Markov model that are unifeeler, we know what that is. Um, but I have to convince you of that because what we did on Thursday is I said what we're really interested in is pr just prediction. And I went through a long series of uh, uh, con constructions and steps in an argument that ended up with this thing here. This predictive or causal equivalence relation. Right? And it was motivated by, well maybe I over explained it on Thursday, but a really simple idea. We're trying to predict this process and <clears throat> we make this assumption or ansatz that the effective states of the process are groups of histories, each one of which leads to the same prediction. Right? So in other words, we don't make distinctions between histories if, having seen them, they lead us to the same prediction. Are we going to get more into prediction later? Yes. Okay. I feel like prediction can be highly subjective. Uh, right. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong there. No, no, that's a fair point. Um, it typically is. So, well, right. So, but basically the idea is your partition would be dependent on your right. prediction. Well, okay, so that, that, that was the way the Thursday lecture started out. I allowed us to make any assumption. All I'm interested in from the golden mean process is predicting the number of ones. So that's a particular task I set myself, and that's obviously a subjective choice. And there are good and bad ways of doing that, and that was our, our sort of candidate scheme R which, as soon as I state that, it, it induces effectively a partition of the space of histories. It groups them in certain ways. Okay. So what I have to still prove to you is that this predictive equivalence relation is sort of the way, with capital T-H-E, the way to do optimal prediction. Today we're going to do examples, so we get some idea of what the power and what the consequences are of assuming this relation. But then I have to come back Thursday, maybe next week, we're going to go through and I have to prove to you that there was this resulting representation, the epsilon machine, is an optimal predictor. It's of minimal size and lets us basically calculate everything we're interested in information theoretically or, or even coming up with good prediction algorithms. So it's a pretty outrageous claim, namely that, that this thing, again, given the specification of the process, that's up to you. 
you've got an experiment or a mathematical model, you have to come up with a word distribution. But once you give me that, the rest of this just follows. I apply this equivalence relation and things happen. So I'll show you mechanically how things happen, how we discover the hidden states. But it all starts from here. <coughs> but I have to prove these properties that I was arguing for on Thursday that actually does prediction in an optimal sense. Last Thursday, my notion of prediction was pretty, was very general. All I wanted back were these future morphs, just distributions over the futures, okay? So in fact, that's how this is constructed, right? So I'll just state this again. So what we're doing is we have our space of histories, all these different histories, and we group into the same class two different histories when condition on those particular histories, S prime and S double prime, lowercase means realization. So we've seen these two histories. We then do the best we can to predict the future. And when those distributions, future distributions, are the same, we say the process is in the same causal state. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but it really is just as simple as don't make distinctions between histories that are predictively effective. Why make a distinction? You can if you want. You'll end up with more partition elements in a larger model, but you don't have to do that. And then basically from this, basically everything is going to follow. But I will have to prove that to you with a series of, I think, constructive proofs. Okay, so this is the basis here. And all the motivation last Thursday was to have this make some sense. But it's a pretty simple idea. Um, okay, so in terms of terminology, so if we start with the space of pasts, um, we basically go through there, however, and develop these, these future morphs, or I should say, first the, the causal states. These are sets of paths that are equivalent under this equivalence relation. And then they, we also have <coughs> this series of um, future morphs. Given that I know what causal state I'm in, I have the, the distribution over all the future uh, sequences that could occur, right? And then we think of the uh, <coughs> um, the causal states as these groups of histories. So that's one, a causal state has several things attached to it. One is it's just a set of histories. And different sets of histories lead to different predictions. Uh, there's the whole set, so we can kind of write that compactly as sort of the original space we're starting with. And then in sort of algebraic notation, we sort of mod out by this equivalence relation. And the, the resulting uh, set is a set of these states, or set of sets of histories. Okay. Um, there's another way to describe the induced partition over the space of pasts. That's with this epsilon map. And that's just a simple lookup function. When I plug in a particular history, it returns the set or causal state, or if you like, the name, state 7. Okay, so we have a functional representation of this. Um, um, and then, of course, like I said, attached to each state is some view of the future. Yeah. Um, is there a reason why down below you have the L and the up top? Oh, uh... I mean, are we going to get into when you're considering only finite links and when you're considering... Yes, the yeah. In fact, I'll kind of do that today with the examples. Um, here, I was just grabbing things to make a summary slide, so maybe it was a little bit, yeah. Yeah, some yeah. Different parts right, yeah, yeah. Certainly do practical, and you'll see that today when we do this uh, reconstruction process. Okay, so then we went from sort of the raw set of histories, grouped them together so they're predictably, predictively equivalent, and then the set of morphs attached to each state or the set of prediction, different predictions we make. Once we had those states, we can then go through and look at if I'm in state 7 and I see a 1, what's the probability I go to state 12? I can go through that. I call that causal state filtering. If I had a, a series of measurements, at each moment in time I can stop and I've seen some history, I apply the epsilon function that says, oh, you're in step, you're in state seven, seeing something else, I have a new history, oh, you're in state 12 and so on. So I end up going from a raw data string, applying the epsilon function to this causal filtering, then I have a process over causal states now and I can figure out what the transition probability is between those states. Okay, so, so that's the, again, the epsilon machine. Set of states and some set of transitions. So it's a kind of Markov, hidden Markov model. Right, we have measurement alphabet and then these set of states, they're different things, and then this transition structure over it. And I have to tell you what the properties are of this. For example, we have to prove that this model, this particular induced 
equivalence relation induced model actually is unifilar. That's not obvious. In fact, it kind of becomes an interesting property to deal with when you're doing actual reconstruction estimation. Um, there's a unique start state. The way we think about that is I haven't made any measurements yet. Um, formally, it's the equivalence relation. Remember, equivalence relation, we use square brackets. Um, basically means we haven't seen anything yet. Uh, or the other way you can think about it is that the start state corresponds to starting with all the probability in this state here. Um, and uh, this example we'll come back to again. It's actually the even process, 1, 1, any number of zeros, 1, 1. Um, we have recurrent states that are induced. You rattle around here for a while, but as soon as you transition out of that set, you never go back. And then there'll be a recurrent component where we asymptotic a long time. We just keep rattling around in here. So transient and recurrent states get induced by the equivalence relation. <coughs> so we think of them in terms of states. So four causal states here. All the edges are labeled with a symbol and a transition probability. Okay, we're calculating all that from the word distribution. Number of states, which transitions there are, how they're labeled, and what the transition probabilities are. That's all calculated from the word distribution. So I'll show you how to do that in various cases. Okay, so that was the end result. Again, I have to tell you, prove to you various properties about that. But let's first just think about, and this is a little bit, uh, Doing some examples helps us think about what this predictive equivalence relation means. Also, what kinds of properties we're learning. So, <coughs> so I call um, any process that goes from, any, I should say, say, procedure that goes from a specification of the word distribution or a process to an epsilon machine by applying the equivalence relation, I call that reconstruction. A lot of times that's analytical, so We'll maybe go through some examples from statistics mechanics, various kinds of spin systems. You write down a Hamiltonian, describes the interaction between the spins. Uh, then you can derive how many causal states there are. We can look at systems going through phase transitions, talking about critical exponents and all that, if you're familiar with statistical physics and critical phenomena. So there's an analytical approach to that. I still call it reconstruction, but it's an analytical calculation of the causal states and transition structure. Or you can think of this, and this is maybe the vocabulary I use the most, although half the examples will be analytical, as if, talk about it as if it was some sort of finite sample I get a machine at. We'll talk about finite sample fluctuations. Uh, today, we're gonna assume we have the exact description of the word distribution. So it's up to you to come up with the word distribution, and then we turn the crank, okay? And there are a number of different algorithms at this point, different ways of implementing the estimation of the causal states and transition structure. Um, on the one hand, Thursday was the mathematical theory behind this. Next Thursday and next Tuesday will be more proofs in the mathematical case where we're assuming exact word distributions, exact description of the process. And then whenever you look at real data, finite sample with noise and all these other lim limiting properties, different algorithms, different I implementations of the mathematical ideas have different forms and make different assumptions about the, the data and the source. So we'll talk about that. Today I'm going to give you kind of a cartoon version of what's called subtree reconstruction, or I could almost call it morph reconstruction. Subtree here is sort of this tree of futures here. Um, you can, these methods apply to both temporal data and also space-time data, so uh, you know, if there's Request, we'll, we'll go back to the cellular automata case and apply, modify the, the, the causal equivalence relation to apply to space and time data, to patches in, in space time. Not just time where we have histories, but space time where we have light cones of dependence. I can show you how to extend that. Um, causal state splitting, well, how to say this? Subtree reconstruction, it's like every data point is a possible state, and then I group things together. Sometimes you call it subtree merging. There's, a, there's the opposite one, another algorithm called causal state splitting reconstruction where you assume the data coming to you is an IID process, has no memory. And as you look at more data, you look for kind of statistical justification for adding more states, inferring more causal states. So we split states. Here we, every data point starts out, every word starts out as a separate state and we merge. So high complexity model gets smaller and smaller in subtree merging. 
causal state splitting starts with a, a single biased coin or multinomial process and splits and builds from below. And the model gets more complex. So empirically, these kind of bracket the truth. They should converge in, in, in machine model size from above and from below to the truth. Spectral reconstruction, this is just a different kind of thing. We've been using this to, uh, it goes from a power spectrum, so frequency spectrum, to an epsilon machine. Been using this to study uh, the structure of complex materials using diffraction spectra, x-ray diffraction spectra. Um, there's another approach uh, we call the optimal causal inference. It's related to this method called the bottleneck. This is more related to what Shannon introduced called the rate distortion theory. And it's a nice way of looking at how model complexity trades off against desired approximation level. I might have a thousand state model, but I don't want to work with that. I, I'm willing to give up 5% prediction error if the result is five states. That's a huge win. So that's called optimal causal inference. Again, applies to time or space-time data. And then more recently, we're working on something we call enumerative Bayesian inference. This is sort of, sort of the most uh, straightforward. We have a way of going through and exactly enumerating all of the epsilon machines up to some number. Like right now, the current thing, this is kind of an algorithmic challenge. We're up to uh, um, eight, eight causal states, with something like 44 billion of them. We actually ran a machine and calculated all these things. And the Bayesian method will have maybe Chris Strolai, my postdoc, come in and talk about Bayesian inference generally, but also how you can apply that to figure out from a given sample which of these candidate machines in this library, this enumerated library, is the best fit. It's just very direct application of what's called Bayesian inference. Anyway, point here is many, many, many different ways of doing this. And we can pick some of these later on to talk about <coughs> uh, as time allows. Um, but now I, I just want to give you a, a, a flavor of this using the subtree merging approach. So what I'll do is go over the steps and then uh, we'll, we'll st go through some examples explicitly. <clears throat> okay, so well, we're gonna start with the word distribution. So this is the input to subtree merging reconstruction. You have to give me this and it has to be accurate. Okay, we're gonna assume that. So what we're gonna do is form something called a parse tree. It's basically all the words of length D on a tree. Then we use that data structure to form estimates of or approximations of the future morphs conditioned on different pasts. Um, once we figure out the number of distinct future morphs, those are going to be in one-to-one -one correspondence with the causal states. We actually go back and look at which, uh, in this parse tree, which nodes made different predictions, basically name them. We can then get the state-to-state -state transitions from that, <coughs> and, and then we're done. So number of disti statistically distinct morphs, that gives us the causal states. And then we can go back and get the state-to-state -state transition structure from the tree. In this particular um, algorithm, we have three parameters, like all algorithms. Like that, there's another one, of course, which should, should just be how long, how long uh, the data sample is. But I'm assuming we're gonna, you're going to give me the uh, exact uh, word distribution. So we have d, the depth of this parse tree, the number of steps we're looking into the future, and the number of steps we're conditioning on in the past. So three, three parameters. Okay, so how does this work? So again, you should think in your mind what we're trying to do. The basis is just a direct implementation of the causal equivalence relation, right? We were comparing future morphs, so we have to make some choice about how we're gonna do that comparison over what length of futures and pasts. Okay, so here's an example. So if I had M sample, or a string of length M like this, um, what I'm going to do is uh, first lay out, since a binary alphabet, I lay out a binary tree to some depth. In this case, I'm choosing d equal 5, so that's a parameter. Um, of course, then, and then I'm going to look at all the words of length 5 here. So I have a number of instances of that in a data sample of length m is m minus d. <coughs> m tends to be large, so this difference. Is and then uh, in this particular way of during the reconstruction, the history lengths we're going to use are either 0, 1, 2, or 3. Basically, any, any possible length. So, so we put down our, our tree here. The top tree node is the start node. You'll see what that means in just a second. And what we're going to do is just go through. We have our window of, of d equal 5. And we're just going to sweep that through 
And then for the length five words we see, we just put in a path. We just label the path. There's some path. If we don't see a particular word, then we're going to basically take that path out. So if I see 01010, I put in 01010. Move one step forward. I have a new length five word. Put that in, starting at the top tree node. OK, so here, 10101. 10101. 0, 01011. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. So that was similar to a previous word except the last symbol. That last little leaf was added. <clears throat> and then as we're doing this, the number of times we visit each node, even the start node, we just, there's a little counter sitting there. Every time we hit the node, we increment it. And what we're doing, in a sense, is just keeping track of the number of words that lead to a given node. So if this says 13 after I'm done here, that means I've seen the word zero 13 times. Just that simple. <sighs> All we're doing here is giving, call it like a, a tree or hierarchical representation of the word distribution. This is the, the words of length one, zero ones. The words of length 2 and their counts are down here, right? 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, and so on. Words of length 3, words of length 4. That's all we're doing. So nothing, this is very straightforward. In fact, I hope you're thinking, I can code that up. Okay. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, if we had lots of data, we're feeling confident, then we can also estimate the probability of the word 0, 0 by just taking the node count and dividing it by the total number of samples we had. That's our empirical frequentist estimate of each word, we can replace the counts with their probabilities. So again, I'm assuming we have the exact word distribution, so I can do that directly. But you can kind of see here, if you actually were to do this step by step and you had a finite data, then there'll be some issue about how good an estimation of the word is, the probability of the word is. I'm going to assume we have that exactly. So that's just easy to work with. So here, now the first step, we've gone from process, description, the word distribution, and now we have this hierarchical picture of the word distribution, where each node, in a sense, is associated with the probability of the word that leads to that node. So the probability of 0, 1 in that example is we have this path, the word 0, 1 leads to here, and I store the probability there. Right, and that's, in, in other words, each, each one of these nodes is just some marginal distribution of this length D word distribution. Okay, so we just build that up. <clears throat> so, uh, okay, so that's uh, the first step. Then the second step is we actually want to figure out what the conditional transition probability is between nodes on the tree. In other words, if I see word W, well, I have that probability. I just look up W, oh, I have that probability. And then I see a new symbol. Now I have a new word. So I see W. I see a new symbol, and that takes me to a new tree node. But I'm interested in what's the relative probability if I'm in node n, what's the probability of going to node n prime and seeing s? So I'm taking these absolute word probabilities in this tree structure and recalculating them to be sort of local transitions, lo local transition probabilities on the tree, right? So what I'm interested in is the probability of going from n to n prime. Um, that's basically just. Uh, this ratio of the word probabilities here, right? The words that go to n prime and n. Or the other way, think about it since w prime is ws, seen w, then cs, this ratio is just the conditional probability of probably seeing a zero or one given the, uh, the word, a history word. So I've seen some word, probably seeing one or seeing zero. Okay, so that's how we calculate that from the previous tree. Just simple. Before we had probability of W, probability of uh, W prime, and we're just taking the ratio of those probabilities, and that then, then is a node condition transition probability. So if you go through and do that, so now what I've done is, and this is just an example, we'll go through uh, um, something like this uh, in just a bit, but just to show you what the, the step is. So now what I'm going to do is I've gone through and changed the absolute word probability tree into a tree that is just labeled with these 
node-to-node -node transition probabilities. I've just gone through and calculated the, the ratio, word here, word here, and so on, all the way down. So every link between two nodes is now a symbol, 0 and 1, and a probability of seeing them. And I've just kind of filled in the numbers just to illustrate the next step is to find subtrees. So what I'm going to do is just look at paths of length 1 and future morphs of length 2. In other words, I'm going two steps ahead. So I'm trying to find all the future conditional distributions over the next two symbols given I've seen one in the past. Okay. So here's one example calculation. It's highlighted here in the red and green. Red is the history. So I'm going to ask, what's the probability of the next uh, two symbols? Right there are four of those. I can see 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, given that I saw a 0, specific. So, and then on the tree, the point here is to think about this, what this looks like on the tree. I've seen this one, so I'm in this tree node. And then I want to, given that, I want to calculate the probability of seeing 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Well, how do I do that? It's pretty simple. Given that I'm here, the probability of seeing 0, 0 is just the product of those two transition probabilities. Four ninths. So given that I saw a zero, my prediction I'm going to see zero, zero is f four ninths, or zero, one would be uh, two ninths, and so on. So I just kind of wrote, wrote these out here. So given this, given this, uh, uh, this, this is one of the morphs, right? Conditioned on a past of length one that gives me a certain view of what's going to happen in the future two steps ahead. So these are the morphs. Okay, so, so the, the intermediate punchline is that we were thinking, oh, I want to do these future distributions. Those are just subtrees. Somewhere on this big parse tree, we're trying to find all the dis probabilistically distinct subtrees calculated this way. Yeah? So is, is it necessarily true that L plus K is less than B? Um, uh, well, okay, the problem is you'll bottom out down here, right? Right. So yeah, so there are some trade-offs. There are constraints. In fact, I said before, if these, we have these, these three parameters for subtree merging reconstruction. In fact, they're, they're related to each other. Yeah. And, and exactly how you do that in the sort of finite case, uh, there's a little more work to do, which maybe we'll have some time to talk about. But here, I just want you to think graphically. I, I, I've done this, this move from what seemed to be this very formal equivalence relation definition to being very concrete. We're just looking at subtrees. And it's just simple transformations of the original word distribution into these transition, node to node transition probabilities. And we just go calculate all these. And I made the assumption, just to keep things simple, that we're just going two steps in the future and just looking at one in the past. Jim, yeah? If our data is not in binary, it's not zeros and ones, then you can use the same process, but yeah. the tree just looks radically thicker. Yes. Right. Right. So, so the branching here, if it was a five letter alphabet, I'd have five links coming out, A, B, C, D, E, right? Which means these trees, if you, if you think of this as a data structure, practical implementation, it gets a little out of control. So, but that's fine. I'm that's understanding the challenges of my project better. Yes, good. <laughs> yes, I Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, as soon as the more alphabet, <laughs> larger alphabet. Um, again, so, so another case, let's look over here. I'm conditioning on the past of length one. And then I look to see probably 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Those are slightly different numbers now. Okay, so we're calculating this morph. And if, if you look at this, so here is the future, two steps ahead. And we have these probabilities attached to those four sequences. Notice that these four probabilities, the ones I get if I've seen a 1, are different than these. In other words, the two morphs are different. This morph is different from this morph. They're different predictions in the way I'm using the word prediction. Okay, so, so let's just kind of assume that we've done this and we realize that, oh, even if I condition on, you know, a length two words, all I see are these two different morphs. The two steps ahead, I had, had these two different distributions and then I would say that we have these two different morphs. So now I'm just thinking of just the, the, just the probability distribution over futures as some kind of signature for the predictions. And what I'm kind of assuming to get through this kind of quick tour 
is that that's all in the tree. Even if I had the original tree was depth 100, let's just assume that that's it. I, I went through, and these are the only depth two subtrees that I saw. The only two morphs that I saw. Condition on histories of length. Zero, one, two, three, four, that's it. So that's it, first conclusion. This process that made the word distribution from which I made the, the tree, the parse tree, has two causal states. So I'm going from what their distributions are now, I'm just talking about their names at this point. Okay. Then what I can do is go back into the tree and I go to each tree node and I look two steps ahead and say, oh, is that morph A or B? And I put that name for the causal state up here. Right, because if I haven't seen anything, that's the top tree node, I haven't seen anything, my prediction is that it looks like this, two steps ahead. Well, that's A, that's the subtree A. If I come down, if I've seen a zero, well, this is the example I gave you, <coughs> then hanging beneath it, there's a depth two tree, that's, a, that's the B morph. If I saw one, then we have the A morph. If I saw one one, I have the A morph down here and so on. I just go through and just relabel the tree nodes with the subtree name from morph hanging beneath it. Well, that's handy, yeah? So, did it, did it just work out that way with the top down match? Yes, 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 yes. In this example, we're gonna go through all the different cases, okay. all the base cases shortly. In fact, I'm maybe kind of, I will over explain it, make it over explicit. But I'm trying to make it, <laughs> rather than seem abstract, it's completely mechanical at this point. I'm telling you all the little stages. I mean, these slides are explicit enough, you could at least go, in principle, after lecture, just go code it up if you wanted to, right? So. Okay, so, so now I have this kind of relabeled parse tree. I have the causal states. I just put their names up there. What are the state-to-state -state transitions? I just read them off. Right, A goes to A on a one with probability a half. A goes to B on symbol zero with probability a half, and so on. Okay, so that's the net result is we end up with these two states and then transition structure. Okay, so A goes to A on symbol one with a half. I just fill in the transitions. A goes to B on symbol zero with a half. B goes to itself on symbol zero with two thirds and then B goes back to A on a, with probably one third and generates a one. Okay, so, so that's just real quick. I made a bunch of assumptions, didn't really start with a given data string, but I wanted to lay out the steps so when we go through the particular examples are kind of clear. So again, it's just, given the correct word distribution, you build the parse tree, calculate these node-to-node -node relative transition probabilities, calculate these morphs, they're easy to see now, they're just the distinct subtrees. Those are synonymous with uh, the number of causal states. Go relabel the tree and I can get the state-to-state -state transition structure. Result, epsilon machine. Okay, I'm making a number of assumptions so that works. The most important of which is actually that the word distribution is, is correct. Okay, <clears throat> so the rest of the lecture, I just want to work through these. Part of that is to get back to the prediction game we played intuitively and show you that there's no intuition involved in this. Um, in fact, remember the period two case? That was a little bit bizarre, it was a little bit surprising. So why? Well, we'll explain that. And then, you know, some of our sort of favorite process generators. Well, imagine that we have the word distribution for the golden mean and show that, in fact, the generator we're familiar with, that we assumed, actually is entailed from that same thing for the even process. Although what I'm gonna do here is just what I do, what I call topological reconstruction, not do the probabilities, and then the homework assigned today, due next week, as you go through the probabilistic calculation of the morphs and, and some interesting things that happen when that. Okay, so back to period one, right? This is the boring example, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, you can, I can imagine, like when I'm feeling particularly cranky or something, uh, processes where every different history leads to a different prediction of the future. Is it not that as you look at longer and longer words though that they may converge to sort of an epsilon machine and then 
Yes, right, right, right. So you'll see uh, uh, in the upcoming lectures when this sort of holds true, under what mathematical assumptions. So for example, we're gonna assume stationarity, um, uh, sort of a finite memory property, then we'll end up with a finite number of causal states. There'll be other cases where we have an infinite number of, of uh, it's an infinite memory process with long range correlation and what we'll see, that corresponds to a countable infinity of causal states. So in those cases in particular, as you look at longer and longer sequences, you get more and more states. You keep discovering new things. So, but th there's a way we can deal with that using this technique called renormalization group that uh, lets us sort of bootstrap up to infinite memory models from finite memory assumptions. Yeah. So here, today, just the simplest base case and you know, there are any number of ways this can fail. Finite data, the window's not big enough. I mean, right, the real exercise I give you like maybe we should just do this, give you a bunch of data. <laughs> and then I don't tell you anything. Well, I guess I kind of, there is a homework that does that. Uh, and then you have to discover for yourself what's going on. And then also come up with some narrative description of what the property is. Right? Typically you don't know, is this an infinite complexity process or not? I don't know. So there are these different ways we have of approaching that, that we can now make systematic. Okay, but let's go. Deal with the simple cases and we can kind of dispatch them. Uh, move on to more co complicated, interesting things. Okay, so the period one process. So it's just all ones. So again, let's just step through. So I'm gonna choose to make a parse tree of depth five, which means I have this window of length five. And every time I see a word of length five, I build up the tree here. I put in a path that corresponds to that. So one, 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 okay. Shift over here, okay. Next word. Five ones, one, 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 and so on, right? So, so the parse tree is just this. <clears throat> In fact, I kind of jumped ahead and even calculated the relative node to node transition probabilities, and the probability one. If I've seen nothing, I'm gonna see a one. If I saw one, I'm gonna see a one. If I saw one, one, I'm gonna see one, one, and so on, right? So the space of histories of this process that I kind of drew as a set is actually just one point, all ones. Okay, so now, how many morphs are there of depth two? Subtree shapes. One, right? So here, I look two steps ahead, I've got that. Okay, I'll put that over here, one, one. Come down here, look ahead, up, oh, that, the same thing that I saw before, same thing, so it's just one. So there's just one morph of depth two. Conclusion, there's one causal state. Okay, call it A. So I go back and I label the tree with the A's and A goes, to, A goes to A on symbol one with probability one. Okay, right, we can exactly write down what the future morphs are for all length, future lengths L, conditioned on basically any past and then we end up with the epsilon machine. That's just one state. It is the start state. So that's the other thing I should tell you here is that whichever um, causal state is associated with the top tree node, that is the unique start state of the epsilon machine. And I denote that with the concentric circles here. Okay, so A goes to A on symbol one with probability one. Uh, we have this <laughs> utterly trivial, <laughs> trivial one by one symbol labeled transition matrices, right? There's sort of no uncertainty as to what state we're in. Uh, what's, th what's the asymptotic distribution over the state? <laughs> One, again, kind of trivial. Um, if you remember how we calculated for unifeeler hidden Markov models, the entropy rate, well, okay, so I go to each state, well, in this case, state A with probability one, and I look to the future, and what's my branching uncertainty? Zero. So the information version of that is that the entropy rate is zero for this. Statistical complexity. So last Thursday we talked about the size of model. Well here we've got one state and we apply P log P to the state distribution. Well, there is one event, A, that's completely certain. There's no information in that. So the statistical complexity is zero bits. Okay. So this is you know, genuinely flogging a dead horse at this point, right? It's all ones, even the first time we did it in the prediction game was obvious. 
but still, it's an important base case. And here's the other important base case. Remember the fair coin? So here, well, that was the previous sample, but you know, imagine I give a long enough sample, or I just tell you it's a fair coin. It's the uniform distribution over words of any length. I build the parse tree of depth five, and I'm kind of jumping ahead here just because it should be kind of obvious what the node-to-node -node transition probability should be. From every tree node, it, I get 50-50-0-1 generation. Okay, so I do that, and then the question is, how many probabilistic distinct morphs of depth two are there? One, exactly. So far, these are not difficult. Stay tuned. <laughs> right, there's one. There's one. Right, you just go here, you look down here, and you say, oh, actually, zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. They're all, they're all four of their sequences have probability one, one quarter. And I make the same conclusion down here. No matter what, I, what history I condition on, I look and it's making the same prediction that all length two sequences have the same probability. So they're just one morph. Again, call it A. Now, the space of history is actually the set of all binary strings, semi-infinite binary strings. It's a huge space, right? But we can still write down exactly in closed form what the future morph is for any condition on any sequence going L steps into the future. It's always the uniform distribution over length L binary sequences. Okay, next step. So we've concluded there's just one morph. I go back to the tree and I label all the tree nodes that have that full binary tree of depth two hanging beneath it. Here, 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 everywhere, right? Okay, so then I can read off the Transition problems. A goes to A on a zero, probably a half. A goes to A, probably a half on a one. A goes to A on a one, probably a half, and so on. And so just like we concluded before, we have a single state A, and the transition structures, zero with probably a half, one with probably a half. Now, when we talked about the prediction game on last Thursday, there was a little bit of debate. Maybe it should have been a two state, well, there's a two-state version of this. I could just call it A and A prime and label the previous tree in some way. But this is the minimal one. Again, what I meant by minimal was rather simple. I can't remove this, this, or anything and have it still properly describe a process. And it still captures the fair coin. <coughs> so um, we didn't have to assume minimality here. I mean, it, it, some of you have some familiar with machine learning, and there's, a, in fact, a lot of the, <laughs> the entire discipline is interested in sort of not overfitting and sort of complexity costs and minimizing choosing the smallest model, basically different algorithmic implementations of Occam's razor, right? Don't multiply explanation beyond necessity. We didn't assume it. That fell out. That's when entailed we, by the... When we most likely get something more complicated than rest of Sorry. Yes, absolutely. Right. And we'll talk about finite sample fluctuations, even for a fair coin. Even for a fair coin. Especially. Yeah, it's almost maybe the most interesting case in a way. It's kind of the base case. Yes. So we'll come back to that. Yeah. Right. So next lecture, or after that, I will prove that the, the equivalence relation leads to minimal models. It's not obvious if I give you that, that it's minimal. Once I prove it to you, hopefully it will be obvious, but not right now. So I'm just pointing it out. In this case, I could have had you know, four states with equal branching 0, 1 from each state, and that would still generate a fair coin. But this picked out, because we're doing these equivalence classes, just one state. It gave us the minimal model. So we get minimality for free, in a sense. It's not an additional assumption. Our, the only assumption we're making is trying to do prediction. What's interesting is trying to do prediction leads us to minimal models, minimal structures. OK, so states, well, the set of sequences associated with uh, the, the causal states are just all binary sequences, trivial, symbol labeled transition matrices, one by one matrices, each with probably half. Um, causal state distribution, we have only one state, so we're always there. But now notice, if we go to each state and look at the branching uncertainty to calculate the Shannon entropy rate, the source entropy rate, we have maximal uncertainty. However, we know the process is always in one state. That is not, 
Don't tell me that. I know that. There's no surprise. Therefore, the statistical complexity is zero. Or they, well, let's say this log of one state is zero. So we, we're going to come back and talk about, well, we talked a lot about degrees of randomness with the entropy rate, but we have to think a little more about what the stati statistical complexity means. Last Thursday, I said, well, think of it like model size, roughly. It's kind of the uniformity of the distribution over states. If you have one state, then it's just zero. It's actually related to the amount of memory in the process. But that's something else I have to prove to you. <laughs> so, uh, OK, now let's just tweak things a little bit. We didn't do this on Thursday in the prediction game. But we did do this, remember, way back when, when we first started talking about word distributions and sequences. We did the bias coin. Right, and that was peculiar because A, well, it's a simple generator, and you could just imagine doing probably two thirds for ones and one third for zeros. And it ended up with that really complicated word distribution, that fractal probability amplitude word distribution. Okay. I'm just showing you all of that, the mosaic of the word distributions in a tree form here. Nothing different, just a different graphical representation. Okay, so our bias is two thirds. We go down, and again, I'm kind of jumping ahead uh, how, in how to fill out the tree. Uh, so we see zero would probably be the third, one would probably be two thirds, and so when I calculate the relative to transition probabilities, and then what I see is that basically by hanging, hanging beneath each tree node is the same subtree of depth two. What's the top tree node or down here? You see the same thing, zero, zero is always probability one ninth, and so on. So, how many morphs are there? Just one of depth two. Hence, there's one causal state. Same big space of histories. All sequences occur. What's changed from the fair coin is just this complicated uh, set of probability amplitudes attached to each sequence. We can write out exactly what the, the morph is conditioned on any history. We have this binomial distribution of futures. So that's a nice closed form. So single state, we go back to the tree, we label each tree node with the subtree hanging beneath it. Well, that's all A's, so we sort of agreed on already. So that means we end up with a single state and then transition on a one with probability two thirds, transition on a zero with probability one third. So simple one by one transition matrices, kind of trivial. Uh, this is a simple process, again. Asymptotic invariant distribution is just one. Now, the branching uncertainty is the binary entropy function of two thirds. That's the bias we see at, 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 the, at the single state. But the statistical complexity is still zero. We're always in state A. There's no state information per se. Okay, so. So this is slightly more predictable than the fair coin. The entropy rate's less than one. Okay, so now for the puzzling case for the prediction game, the period two process, right? So zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. We <coughs> go through, uh, look at the, the word of length five, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero. Shift over here, I have a new word, one, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, one. Shift again, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero. Okay, then it repeats after that to depth five. Now, this is the fun question. How many distinct morphs are there of depth two? Two. We have a vote for two. Three? That was kind of tentative. <laughs> Be bold. Right, right, exactly, right. So here, depth two. Or if I'm here, I go, I, I, my, my knee goes this way. <laughs> if I'm here, a knee goes that way. So in fact, there are three. Right, so this is explaining back when we did the, 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 the prediction game why I sort of insisted that there could be these other kinds of states. Now certainly, you know, once, once you sort of forget any initial part, that condition on history is sufficiently long, I'm only going to see futures like this. So this thing is, th th this particular morph, that's zero, the start state, so top tree node, is how I'm figuring out what phase the period two sequences in. I have to measure a zero or one first. Okay, so we can write out explicitly what the space of histories is. Well, it's basically just two points. 
you know, all the histories that end in a zero, well, the history that ends in zero and the history that ends in one. Um, I can just look at what sequences occur conditioned on having seen nothing, top tree node. Well, I can see two uh, futures. If I see a zero, there's only one future I can see. If I see a one, there's only one future I can see. So I can write out this and then calculate the probabilities from the tree. So if I haven't seen anything yet, lambda meaning no measurement, zero or one looks like a fair coin. That's my prediction. I don't know what phase is it. Could be in either phase. However, if I've seen a zero, I know I'm going to see a one and I'm not going to see a zero and vice versa. If I saw a one as my past, I know I'm not going to see a one, I'm going to see a zero. So I go back, label all the, the transition probabilities and then I go uh, put the causal state names at the tree nodes that have this, the morph hanging beneath them. So I have S0 here because it's this Bodhini thing. That's the only place it occurs. And then I have S2 here and S1 here, S2 here and S1 here and so on, all the way down. So we know that uh, S2 goes to S1 on a 1, S1 goes to S2 on a 0. However, S0 can go to either S2 or S1 on a 0, 1 with fair probability. And then that was the answer I gave when we did the prediction game. If I know what the phase is, then I can predict exactly, but getting started before I've made any measurement, I have to see, is it in the zero phase or is it the one phase? And then from that point forward. So if I haven't made any measurements, my uncertainty is the highest. It's, it looks like a fair coin. Zero won't occur with equal probability, but as soon as I make a measurement, I can now start to predict, in fact, exa predict exactly. So that's one of the useful uh, things you extract from laying out all of the, the, the causal states, both transient and recurrent states. The transient states tell you how you come to do optimal prediction. I have to make a measurement first, and then from then on, the entropy rate's zero. My uncertainty is zero. Uh, you can write out, like I said before, th the different histories that are associated with each state, uh, each of the three causal states. And now I have these three by three symbol labeled transition matrices, sparse. Um, the causal state distribution now, asymptotically, all the probability leaks out of here. I mean, I can imagine if I haven't made a measurement, then I assume I'm in the start state. And then that splits out 50-50. And then that just rattles around. So this is my asymptotic state distribution. Start state zero probability, and then S1 and S2 have equal probability. The entropy rate is an asymptotic quantity. So after I've seen an arbitrarily long history, I mean, either S1 or S2, and I look to the future, and there's just one transition possible, so the entropy rate is zero. It's completely predictable. Now, for the first time in the series of examples, I have two states, and there's some information. I can tell you, oh, it's in the sort of even phase or the odd phase of its cycle, and that's informative to you if you don't know what state it's in. So we have two events, equally likely, so there's one bit of state information one bit of statistical complexity. Right. What does that information mean? It's the amount of information in the phase. Yeah? So what happens to the zero when you're given the, the statistical complexity, the, the, the top state? Do you, I mean, I, I don't know how to phrase the question, but mm -hmm. like the, if you're doing P log P. Right. Um, we're, we're doing P log P over this asymptotic state distribution. That's the way I defined it. Okay. Now you could say, now wait a second, I actually happen to be very interested for whatever my application is and how I come to know what the asymptotic state distribution or the, uh, there are other questions. How, if, if I start with all the probability up here, how does that actually relax onto the asymptotic state distribution? So that, that's a question about finite, the, the, the conditioning on finite length histories, maybe length zero even and how that relaxes. So th there, there, there should be some question in your mind about, well, then how does, maybe there's something about how the initial putting all the probability up here and watching it flow down, that might be related to that transient information we were talking about when we looked at the block entropy and how that got to the asymptotic, asymptotic E plus H mu L, the, that linear asymptote. So, yeah, so, so the transient states become important for questions like that. These are just 
time asymptotic quantities for now. <coughs> but there's more structure here. In fact, if I just tell you h mu is 0 and c mu is equal to 1, eh, this is much more informative, right? You, you now, I mean, it's kind of trivial, but there is, you know, and we pulled this out just mechanistically. We weren't guessing. We just turned the crank. It's a period 2 process. There's a certain way you synchronize to it. Imagine it was a period three process. No, one, zero, one, one, zero, one, one, zero, one. You can do the same thing, and there'd be a cycle of three states with, actually it turns out, two transient states that tell you, as you're measuring zero, one, how you come to know which of the three phases the process is in, or period seven. There's actually much more structural information here. The architecture of the machine is really telling you how the process is organized. Okay, so now, um, mixtures of these, kind of more interesting. So what I want to do is uh, talk about the golden mean process. So remember, that's easy. That's golden mean process generates all binary sequences except a zero can't follow a zero. That's the only restriction, right? That's the irreducible forbidden word, zero, zero. And what I'm going to sort of talk through here is uh, not probabilistic morphs, but we're just going to look at what sequences occur in the past and also in the future morphs. I call that topological reconstruction. I'm forgetting all of the, uh, the, the, the word probabilities, just looking at what words occur and which don't occur. And that just means we're putting in certain paths, or not sort of putting in certain paths in the parse tree. Yeah? Uh, so zero, zero can't occur anywhere or only at the right. beginning? Right. Anywhere. Yeah. Never can produce. Right. Okay. So I'll just kind of jump right ahead. I'm, again, I'm dropping all the, the probabilistic part of the argument just to get through it. Um, it's not hard. It's just to simplify because this is one of the homeworks to do the probabilistic reconstruction. Okay. So imagine uh, we try, try to, to argue why the golden mean process has this particular tree structure. Well, the only restriction is 0, 0. <coughs> so I can see 1s. I can see a 1 and then a 0. But if I see a 0, I must see a 1. If I see a zero, I must see a one. So you can kind of tell every time I've seen a zero anywhere in the tree, I cut off, I prune that part of the tree. It's the same thing I pointed out when we were looking at mosaic of word distributions, how zero, zero occurs at length two, and that it actually has a cascading effect all the longer length word distributions where there are subsets taken out and then sort of arguing in the limit infant sequence, that's actually a cantor set of sequences that, that are removed. So that's one way of looking at it is on this tree. One restriction has this infinite cascade of restrictions uh, further down in the tree for longer words that uh, are not allowed to contain zero, zero. Okay, so now the fun stuff. <coughs> okay, so now we're going to look at morphs of depth two. So how many distinct morphs are there? Three. Three. Very fast. Good. Where are they? The right. We always start at the top, right? So the top is kind of branch, maybe like a, a coin flip and then a restriction here. And this part, zero and one. This one here? No. no. That one. Zero and then one. Oh, th this guy down. Okay. So this, this one here. So, so I see a one and then I, then I can see a, a coin flip. And then the first part is uh, zero and the top part. This one here? No, no, uh, from the up to zero. Here? And, yeah, zero, zero and one. One. So this guy. Yeah. Uh, isn't this guy the same as this guy? I always had, it takes me a while. <laughs> right, okay. There's at least this guy. Okay, <laughs> right. Uh, and then if I look here, uh, uh, I have, you know, this one. So that's the second one I haven't seen. If I look over here, well, that's branch and then a restriction. So, so this is the same as this guy up, up, up here. Um, Did I get this confused? I might have copied the wrong thing. Duh, duh. Oh, right. The start state is, is the one state. You have zero, one, one, zero, and one, one. Yeah, no, no, what, I, what I'm actually, okay, I tried to dumb this down from the probabilistic version. Oh, the 
start right. state as uh, It does, actually, right. So I kind of jumped ahead here. So this is some bizarre mixture of <laughs> probabilistic reconstruction. So this is half the answer to the, the homework exercise. So, okay, right, right. So, so in fact, right. Uh, I should have written this out. So what happens if you put in the probabilities that the start top tree node, if I look just one step ahead, I'm basically just looking at the probability of seeing a zero and probability of seeing a one. And that happens to be uh, two thirds and one third in this case. Whereas if I condition on seeing a one, then it turns out that this guy, which has the same shape as this upper one, actually it's 50-50 in this case. So I should go write that over. Which in that case, <laughs> if it's really probabilistic, you get three morphs. Where this is, again, this should be 50-50, I'm sorry, this should be two-thirds, one-third here. And it's different from B because this is 50-50 if you work out the 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 node-to-node -node transition probabilities like I said you should. Obviously C is just a different shape, but A and B would be probabilistically distinct. Yeah, well, interesting. Yeah, I should just drop that. It's, it's the probabilistic reconstruction. I should just not be lazy and put the transition probabilities on there. The net result, if you're doing well, the probabilistic reconstruction is this. This is what I just said. There were three. Then we have this, this the, the, the causal state that's associated with the top tree node. That first branching on zero and one is two thirds, one third. And then uh, it was, <coughs> it was B. Once we've seen a one, then going forward, B is a fair coin flip on a zero and one. And then since we saw a zero leaving C, we have to see a one with probability one because no consecutive zeros. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Kind of jumped the gun on the topological reconstruction. Uh, right. So and then you end up with, with this. So, so this is the answer to one of the homeworks. And what you're supposed to do is fill this out correctly. <laughs> what I should do is just have an AB with these two and then you will then see that there are actually three if you look at the probabilistically distinct future morphs. Right. Okay. Does it make sense to say, I mean, looking at this uh, model here, if you're not looking at probabilities, we'd say states A and B were equivalent. Yes. So it makes right. sense that we... Right, right, yeah. right. And, and, then, and then the transition structure you'd get would be... like that. And this would be the start state. And then it would just be zero, must see the one, and a one like that. Right. Yeah. I'll go clean that up so it actually is the, the uh, topological reconstruction. Right. But anyway, this, this is what you should get with your probabilistic reconstruction. So that's the, ho the target is this for the homework. And then you have to calculate those morphs just like I was doing in the previous examples. And the node-to-node -node transition probabilities. So continuing on. Now that I've got this, you know, hidden Markov model, I can ask, what's the asymptotic state distribution? Well, it's two-thirds, one-third here. State A, transient state, purely transient state. I, after one step, I never see it again, even. Um, so I end up with, uh, again, I go, I'm in state B with probably two-thirds. I see a fair branching. That's one bit of uncertainty, but that only happens two-thirds of the time. So that's two-thirds of a bit, but I'm in state C probably one-third of the time, but there's no transition uncertainty because I'm definitely going to see a one. So the net result is that I have the entropy rate of two-thirds bit per time step. Right. Only two-thirds of the time do I see a, f a fair coin flip from B. Now the statistical complexity is now this kind of mixture of things. It's I have this distribution, so not writing out the number, it's just the binary entropy function of two-thirds. Two events with bias two-thirds. That's the, that's the, st the state information. Um, let's see if I get this topological reconstruction right. <laughs> okay, so the even process. Well, that's a little harder to describe. Maybe that means it's more complex. Um, so the even process generates all binary sequences and when ones occur, 
They occur in blocks of even number bounded by zeros. And every time I see a pair of ones, the next zero or one occur with fair probability. So that's the kind of narrative description of the even process. Okay. So what I've done is I've just put into a depth five tree the words that occur, ignoring the probabilities. Um, and, well, actually, you know, so to depth one, I see zeros or ones. To depth two, I see all length two words. To depth three, well, actually, there's only one forbidden word, right? That was a zero, an odd number of ones and a zero. That's forbidden. In fact, what I should do, but it almost is in, impossible to describe. Remember, we don't see another forbidden word until we get down here. Zero, three ones, zero, one, 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 and a zero. That's forbidden. And at every odd length, there's a new irreducible forbidden word. Zero, odd number ones, and a zero. So new restrictions are coming in. Each restriction at a shorter length has its own cascading pruning that it does for words that can, that can contain it. Those are disallowed. Okay, so now this, again, you have to, <laughs> it takes a little more pondering. I'm pretty sure I got this topological reconstruction right. Okay, so to depth two, and there's a bit of an issue here, right? So now we're starting to see structure over longer futures. You might imagine, well, maybe a tr parse tree of depth six would be better. So there's a bit of a trade-off here. And I'm kind of trying to guess these so I can put it on uh, a graphic that we can actually see. Okay, so here's the parse tree again. So how many uh, depth two subtrees are there? Four. four. We have four. Um, well, okay, let's go through. So the, the way I write the algorithm, I go to each thing. I look at the signature, store that off, see if I haven't seen it. If not, I put it in my list. Go to this one, do the same thing, you just kind of go down. In this case, you're just looking for which words of length four occur. So here, Top tree node, two steps ahead, we see all four binary sequences. Um, here, there's actually a restriction. I don't see one zero, so I put that aside, so that's three. Uh, come down here, well, that's this full binary tree of depth two. I saw that above, ignoring probabilities. Um, sometimes we just take account for this. I mean, we have, we have a star point as a dis different one right. sometimes, but sometimes... That was my mistake on the previous example. What I was showing you were the probabilistically distinct things. I was trying to set it up so I was giving you minimal information, minimal helpful information for the exercise. I gave you too much. So I did half, yeah, I'll, I'll fix that in the slides, so. All right. The previous distinction was a probabilistic distinction. A and B would have been the same if I was just looking at the topological, what sequences occurred in the future. Um, so here, I don't know, I, I kind of do a pattern matching. I mean, it gets a little tedious. Notice if I'm here, I must see a one, and then I have a branch. That's a new one there. Eh, I don't know, you can kind of go, I mean, it's sort of exhaustive. <laughs> you know, you kind of go through here, keep checking, keep checking, keep checking, then there's a decision criteria. Well, in this case, I know I can stop because I define what process we're looking at. So the net result for topological reconstruction is that there are three. Hmm. So, uh, they're very, yeah. If you know what this, the, the process is, there are ways of calculating how far you have to go ahead into the future and into the past to see all of the topologically distinct or and probabilistic distinct causal states. Um, here, I'm just choosing the parameters so it works out. If we don't, uh, I mean, A is the same as when we don't have double, double circle. That's the start state here, start, yeah. start tree node, yeah. yeah. Right. So when the um, That's true, I, sh I should probably... We have another, another it's one. probably a little confusing. I should probably not put the double. I mean, I'm doing that to remind myself that 
not only does this occur further down in the tree, but it's also associated with the top tree node, which means it's a start, it's the start causal state. So, so that, that's what I'm doing here. Yeah, I don't mean that this occurred elsewhere. It can't. This can only be at the top, but it also occurs elsewhere, like down here or down here. Okay, so now, I mean, at some point you start to realize why this is worth programming up. <laughs> you do enough examples, it gets a little bit kind of tedious, but there's still interesting things to do it by hand, but uh, don't have to do it too long. It is a procedure after all. Okay, so now we go back to the tree and label the tree nodes with their associated subtree hanging beneath them. Okay, so A here, start tree node, full binary tree, full binary tree, full binary tree. But if I see a zero, then I end up with this binary tree with this one missing for the odd length thing. And, and so on, B's down here, and then C is this, C a one, and then can branch. So I've gone through and, and labeled all of that. In fact, I even labeled down here because I was actually looking at a depth six tree. So that's an example where I actually had to look at where it's a little bit longer to get this to work out. I mean, I, I, from just looking one step below this tree node, I don't know that it's A. So I actually kind of worked it out, but I didn't display it because it gets very busy. Things shrink down. Okay. So, uh, so, so what, what does this tell us? Topologically, A goes to A and a 1. A goes to A and a 1. A goes to A and a 1. Okay. A goes to B on a 0. B goes to B on a 0. And B goes to C on a 1. C goes to B on a 1 and so on. Uh, notice that most of the tree nodes are just B's and C's. The only place I see A tree nodes is on this far left when I'm seeing 1's. And as soon as I step out of that, I fall back into B and C causal states. So this is kind of hinting that A is going to be a transient state that can map to itself. So we have the three causal states. Uh, can go through like I just did and make a list of what states are allowed on a zero, what state transitions are allowed on a one. Um, this is also kind of mixing things. So you end up with this three state picture, which I should, I'm kind of jumping ahead here. Ignore the transition probabilities for now. But basically you end up with these three states. So here's A. The start state goes to itself on a 1. As soon as I see a 0, I drop down to B. That was the only way of transiting out on the tree of that long series of 1s into the main part of the tree. And then from then on, uh, what is this? Yeah, oh sorry. B goes to C on a 1, then I must see 1, and then B goes to itself on a 0. So now I'm putting in transition probabilities here as if it were a stochastic process. That, that's not really justified topologically. Sometimes what we do is if we just have a machine here without transition probabilities, we talk about the topological machine and we just as a default assumption assume that we have fair coin branching. If you want to calculate a property like the statistical complexity, you have, you have to put a transition probability on there. It's kind of a null assumption. Um, <clears throat> another way to do it would be to take even if this is the topological picture, it, this describes what sequences are generated after probabilities. I can take a sequence generated by the, the actual uh, even process and run it through here and calculate empirically what these probabilities should be. That'd be some kind of approximation. Um, it turns out, and this is sort of the punchline that maybe makes this distinction between topological uh, reconstruction and, and epsilon machines and probabilistic uh, machines clear. For the even process, it turns out there are four causal states, four probabilistic distinct causal states. So the full probabilistic reconstruction shows, in fact, it's, it's almost like that previous single state, transient state that looped to itself on a zero, it kind of splits. There's some modulation of the future probabilities that you have to keep track of. So I actually now have this this loop in the transient states, which means I can stay here as long as I keep seeing ones. Of course, the probability of that goes down exponentially fast, and eventually I see a zero and leak into the two recurrent states, like this. So, so that should look familiar. That, this is the actual 
you know, way we've been thinking about the even process as a generator with those transition probabilities. So you can go calculate these things out like that. Um, so four by four transition matrices. Uh, the, the entropy rate, well, that's easy. It's really just two thirds of the time I'm in C. Did I put down the asymptotic transition uh, state probabilities? No, probably C. Uh, C is seen with probably two thirds, D probably one third. When I'm here, I have a fair coin flip, so that's two thirds of the time I see one bit of uncertainty, but if I'm in D, I'm gonna see one, so that doesn't add. So I just have, just like the golden mean process, the entropy rate's two thirds per, per, per time step, and also the same statistical complexity. I have these two events, C and D, probably two thirds, probably the one third, that's the state information. Okay, so the homework is to elaborate on the topological reconstruction here and write out the, the probabilistically distinct morphs. And as a guide, you should be getting this as the end result. It's not, not too bad. So um, you might find it handy. Um, um, sometimes uh, when I'm doing these calculations by hand, uh, it's nice to have that binary tree there, the parse tree. So I have some PDFs of parse tree paper and morph paper over here. You can download and print out and try it by hand first. Just kind of saves drawing this branching tree, which if you do it by hand is just, it gets lopsided, so reference for that. Okay, so that's it. So these examples, just again, it's a procedure. We just go through this and we get to discover the number of states and the transition structure in, in a process. Again, starting with, it's assuming we're given the word distribution. So in any practical application, this breaks into two steps. Some statistical technique going from finite data that gives you a good word distribution, and then once you have that, then you turn this crank to figure out how many states and the transition structure.